Hello and welcome to the Truth About Real Estate Investing Show for Canadians. These are definitely interesting times to be a part of. My name is Erwin Cito, four-time Realtor of the Year to investors. And today's guest, I would consider among one of the top, top real estate investing coaches in the country. And she's coaching our client, what she's coaching our clients to do in this market may shock many. Uh, cash flow is harder to come by than ever. So of course, people need to pivot. They need to be thinking outside the box in terms of what to do going forward. And unfortunately, some of it's contrary to what many gurus are out there selling in their in their advertising and courses. But before we get to Elizabeth, uh, I ran into some old friends of mine from the Real Estate Investment Network, uh, Cindy and Marson. Uh, I hadn't seen them. Uh, I actually ran into them at a developers developers uh, quote unquote insights and perspectives event, events insights and perspectives events. Uh, you know, anyone who knows me knows I really like to learn. I love to know what uh, developers are thinking in this market, what they're planning on doing, how they see the world. Uh, just to understand where the, you know, I like to hear multiple opinions. I don't do not, I'm never afraid of contrary opinions. I'm always open to outside uh, opinions. Anyways, um, so Sydney Marson and I, we, we, we all uh, passively invest into this developer called Greybrook. Uh, Greybrook is the same company that's presenting at our upcoming iWin meeting, uh, which is online only on September 19th. Uh, the presentation was by the CEO of the securities division. Uh, the presentation was full of charts and graphs on population growth, GDP, or uh, where there was not so much growth, uh, real estate prices on from other major centers in the world, in Canada, and in North America. Uh, the presentation gave a lot of perspective on where the Golden Horseshoe, as uh, where it sits in a more holistic, uh, global perspective, uh, from someone who has a lot of money at risk. <laughs> uh, Sasha, the CEO, even gave his perspective on the the Green Belt land swap scandal, uh, which I find fascinating. Uh, I love to hear opinions from people who are closer to the subject versus myself. I only get to read what's in the news. Uh, I do pay for my news, so it's better quality than most of the stuff out there. Um, but anyways, the plan is to have Sasha on the show in the near future, so I won't spoil it for you. Uh, but if you are attending the Iowan Mastermind Tour on Niagara, in, in the Niagara region on September 23rd, Saturday, September 23rd, you can ask me about it then or at lunch. Uh, I will spoil this for you, though. We are touring a super cool conversion project, a 2,300 square foot single family house that has been converted into a three family home. So that's three units. So there'll be three apartments and it's all under one roof and the same four walls as in there's no addition, there's no garden suite. This is uh, this is a super cool project. They're not common. Uh, probably not many of you out there have ever seen one in person. Uh, one was that was done with permits and renovated professionally. Um, so if you do enjoy learning about real estate, you want to go deeper into your education or, about, around real estate investing and how to make great investments uh, as much as I do, then you do not want to miss this. We are already 80% sold out, so please do not delay. This will sell out. These events always sell out. The tour starts at 10 a.m. Uh, and this will be in Welland, Ontario. So uh, there'll be plenty of time for your beauty sleep. Uh, I'll be there. My team will be there. Uh, and in a world where money makes the world go round, inflation eats away at our savings, incomes are becoming stagnant, investing in hard assets and bad cash flow are a must. Uh, a triplex would be a good a good example of a, a an asset, hard asset that should cash flow. Uh, so come tour an actual income property owned by our client who is himself an award-winning investor. He's been a past uh, guest of the show and he owns over 20 plus properties. So he is legit. Um, uh, he's also a longtime client of mine, so yes, I know exactly what he owns. Uh, it's one of the greatest lessons I, that I've learned in life. Actually, two. Uh, learn from one is learn from people who have what you want. Again, our client, uh, their property has this client has over twenty properties, very successful. Number two, trust but verify. Verify for yourself with your own eyes. See real estate, touch it, feel it, smell it, taste it. Uh, so before you ever make a decision to invest. Such is the beauty of investing in a hard asset like real estate. I believe that's why many of us do invest in real estate. You can see it, touch it, control it. It's yours. Anyways, invites to register already went out in my email newsletter. That's why we're 80% sold out. Uh, and if you're not on my email newsletter, uh, which is so, which should, all should be, because because <laughs> all 17 listeners are on the sh are on our are on our uh, email newsletter, you can join for free at www.truthaboutrealestateinvesting.ca. Let me slow down www.truthaboutrealestateinvesting.ca. Uh, now back to running into my old friends. Uh, they own over a dozen properties in uh, Toronto proper. Um, 
they've been doing it for a long time. Uh, this is real estate winter. That's what I'm calling it, even though we just finished summer. But it's a real estate winter. Uh, this high interest rate environment uh, has shown me a tale of two investors. I can basically group uh, the investor community into two categories. Those who invested primarily before 2020 and those after. Those who acquired most of the portfolio of their portfolio before 2020, they do feel the pinch. They, do, they definitely feel a pinch of the higher interest rates. And uh, many have likely already sold or they're going to sell or they're going to take some more profits uh, on part of their portfolio. Overall, they're just fine, especially when you consider the other group. For those who acquired most of their portfolio, uh, that could mean stocks, real estate, crypto after 2020, they're likely not doing so great. Uh, my crypto holdings maybe are likely an indicative of that, are indicative of that. I timed it poorly. Thankfully, I chose the two that are still around, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Not advice, folks. Uh, especially, uh, and those who invested in single-family homes or condos or took a bad, a bad advice from those uh, one of those several coaches or trainers that are out there who are the, themselves struggling. Um, I actually took a call last week from my friend. Uh, uh, they have. Uh, she has clients who want to, to launch a class action lawsuit against a well-known real estate influencer, uh, a membership group leader. Um, their deals are going bad. They're not getting paid. They're not. Uh, they're not. They're not getting communication from the uh, the borrower. Uh, she. Uh, so my friend has uh, is it looking for a lawyer to connect with her. Her connect her client with, uh, as her client is out several hundreds of thousands of, thousands of dollars actually across more than one uh, borrower so yeah there's uh, there's definitely some um, uh, there's definitely some pain out there um, so tough times are out, out there uh, for everyone so like I said trust but verify life is short I personally only take information from winning sources and I have a non real estate example uh, I'm a big fan of golf as many of you know but I'm terrible at the sport as Anyone who's seen me play knows. <laughs> uh, my podcast of choice in the golf air, in the golf uh, space is Hank Haney's podcast. Uh, if you don't know who he is, that's totally cool. Uh, he's Tiger Woods's former coach. I think everyone knows who Ti Tiger Woods is. And Hank it has another Hall of Fame client uh, named Marco Mira. So Hank has uh, he always borrows this famous quote from a, from a football coach, uh, and it goes, "You are what your record is." as in your track record of wins and losses, that's who you are as a team, as a football team. Uh, personally, I judge coaches in real estate by their track record of producing successful, happy clients. Um, I ran into two of my clients last night at the same event, and uh, they we helped them successfully buy and convert four houses into duplexes that they've since exited uh, in, before interest rates started going up. So they basically nailed it. Uh, they made a lot of money. They are extremely happy, and they're telling me about this uh, lovely trip they have planned to go to Tokyo to watch their daughter run in the Tokyo Marathon. Uh, congratulations um, to my clients. I'm so happy for them. You are what your record is. If you need help improving for your record, myself and my lovely guest today, uh, today's guest in Elizabeth Kelly, she loves to help too. It's why we get along so well. Uh, hopefully Elizabeth Kelly uh, does not need an introduction. I believe this is her third or fourth time on the show. Uh, she tells it like it is, um, as a real estate coach should uh, tell you in, in helping you shape your portfolio. Elizabeth was a paid professional educator for the Rich Dad Canada organization since 2012, before, they, uh, since, before they've gone away. Uh, they, they've since rebranded. I don't know where they're at right now, but anyways. Um, uh, she's taught a couple thousand investors, including many of today's uh, today's influencers and coaches and full-time real estate operators. She's very proud of that. She should be. She should be proud of that. Uh, she has her own property management company called Sandstone Property Management that manages hundreds of doors across multiple strategies, including apartment buildings, Airbnb, midterm rental, rent-to-own. Elizabeth's done around 100 rent-to-owns, I believe. Uh, she's the longest-time investor in New Brunswick that I know personally. Uh, so before going there, uh, I forget the number. I think she owned something like 45 doors or something in New Brunswick. So, And she's done, it, done, done that, owned it for close to 10 years. So again, if you're interested in going to New Brunswick, you want to hear uh, an unbiased opinion, talk to Elizabeth, uh, reach out to her. She doesn't mind. Uh, Elizabeth is hosting her second conference uh, after the highly successful inaugural Real Estate Resilience on uh, Real Estate Resilience Conference, which is online, and she's back again for 2023. The price is extremely affordable at $74, and the link is in the show notes. Um, if you just look her up on social media, 
uh, then you'll find links there as well. Uh, Elizabeth Kelly, really easy to spell. Uh, there are several friends of mine who are and past guests of the show uh, who who are uh, speakers at this event. And I even have a client on the, on the speaker panel. So if you want to go deeper into what successful pros are doing, especially during this environment, then you want to check out the Real Estate Resilience Summit, a two-day event, September, sorry, Saturday and Sunday, October 14th and 15th, all day. Recordings, I believe, are available to you. Uh, please enjoy the show. So Elizabeth, we've been thoroughly updated, <laughs> getting caught up for the last 40 minutes before we start recording. What's keeping you busy these days? <laughs> we always have so much to talk about. I feel like we need to have like weekly meetings to get caught up on all of all of our insights and uh, opinions and everything. I, I really respect your opinion. You have so many amazing contacts. Thank you for having me back. No, thanks for coming on the show. I'm I'm blessed with the you know I've I've like 350 something past past clients. So and I speak to a lot of them on a regular basis. So I, I have some data available to me. My crystal ball is no good though, <laughs> and I still think it's early. I still it's uh, we're recording on August 29th, so I think the pain is still early for investors. Um, yeah. But yeah, let's, let's let's dig into it. Let's dig into what are those conversations that you're so uh, like. Just to just to for the listeners' benefit, how many coaching clients do you have, or how many strategy calls are you doing a week with investors? Right now, I'm doing between two and four strategy calls a week. So this is an investor who has come to me, and they're having there's some sort of issue. So either they're looking at buildings, they'd like a second opinion, they want to run numbers with someone. Or uh, what is predominantly happening now is they're realizing that their portfolio is not cash flowing anymore. Um, They don't have the capacity to work more hours at their job to make more money. So they want to figure out how are we going to ride out this rough patch? And I mean, originally, you know, when I was at your your Wealth Hacker last year, you know, our crystal ball at that point was we thought things were going to be starting to turn around in 2024. That's only a few months away. I don't think I see that happening anymore. Like, It'll depend. I, It'll depend. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see when the Bank of Canada's rhetoric changes because uh, I don't think everyone, anyone ever saw how sensitive our real estate market would be to interest rates. Uh, yeah. but it is apparently extremely sensitive. So I'm, I'm waiting to see how the market responds when the rhetoric of the Bank of Canada is that we are, we're done raising rates, which yeah. I think will be sometime next year. Because they did that, yeah. they they did that, they did that, they did that trick to us in the spring, and the market yes, they did. went up quite a bit, and then they mm-hmm. you know went back to hiking rates. <laughs> but I, I think it's not just the interest rates that's causing people pain right now. It's the fact that so much of the income that two years ago they had to do things like invest, so much of that is going to cover the increased cost of groceries, of gas, of you know utilities. Mm-hmm. I mean, all of those have gone up across the board. So when we were were comfortable two years ago those same people are not comfortable right now yeah, yeah, so yeah. going back to your original question a lot of my strategy calls are how do i cover this deficit should i be selling my property what else can i do should i do i need another job do i need to go get a job at starbucks in order to be able to you know cover my mortgage and everything and that's you know putting aside all the challenges with the landlord mm-hmm. tenant board and assuming all the tenants pay mm-hmm. Oh, which just, is a whole uh, other kettle of fish. Use this fact of the day, like bookkeepers, virtual bookkeepers charge like $60 an hour. And you can do that from anywhere you want. So, and there's a big demand for bookkeepers in case anyone needs, needs a side hustle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, continue. No, that's okay. Um, so a, a lot of people are quite honestly struggling right now. So in my strategy calls, I'm sitting down and saying, okay, let's take a look at what you have now. How do we optimize this? Where are the opportunities to, you know, rent out a shed, get a couple of extra, you know, a couple hundred dollars more over here? Where can we, you know, you this property just, uh, you know, your tenant moved out. Okay, what mm-hmm. can we do instead? Can mm-hmm. we, you know, increase the quality of this unit? Can we move to a midterm rental from a long-term rental? Mm-hmm. Um, where can we increase our income? Where can we reduce our expenses to try and get closer to that break even point? Mm -hmm. And then a lot of my clients, once we kind of stabilize where they're at, then it becomes what's the next step. So looking at financing options, opportunities, what's, you know, could they look at buying in the future when the deals start to come up? And then the third piece that I'm actually doing a lot of, just like you said, with virtual bookkeepers is 
what transferable skills do I have that someone would pay me for to help me generate some extra income without committing to a job? So whether it's, you know, design or whether it's, um, you know, project management or construction or, you know, these are all things that real estate investors, you know, you find someone you know, like and trust and you'd be willing to hire them to help you out with a couple of projects. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, that's where a lot of investors are right now. It's it's really it's not as much. And I know there's a lot of shiny stuff on social media, which just makes me it makes me so frustrated because beginner and intermediate level investors. It's so easy to get swept away in the like shiny prettiness on social media, the like mm -hmm. unicorns and the, you know, the the amazing deals. And most of the deals that I'm seeing now that are worth putting money into it's a business case. It's not a building. It's a, a, a motel that's going to generate income. It's a commercial building that's going to generate income. It's not just about buying a building on a piece of property and thinking that that's going to cover the bills because it doesn't right now, in, mm -hmm. at least in Canada for the most part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that shift as well with the many with some with a small number of investors. I remember talk, speaking to one last week at Andrew Hines' golf tournament. He's saying he mm -hmm. his next piece of real estate will will be a recreational property likely some sort of recreational like um so like campground for example buy the land yep. and operate a campground or type of recreation business yeah my i mean i look at i've had my portfolio for years so the reason why i'm doing okay right now is because a lot of my buildings and my portfolio overall have a fairly low loan to value typically the sort of ideal sweet spot for a portfolio is between 60 and 65 percent loan to value so when you see everybody running out right now and putting second mortgages on and bringing the value of their portfolio up to 90 percent you have to be very careful that you're not just kicking the ball down the road and setting yourself up for trouble in 12 months. Right. So then, the buildings and the, the ways that I've been able to optimize myself is I've taken my commercial building and it was struggling and I've turned around and I've put money into upgrades and I put money into marketing and the combination of those two in six months, I brought my building back from a negative position into the positive. And then uh, you're talking about like the paint, the, the paint, the things that make you cringe on social media about making money. Uh, was mm -hmm. it Ben, um, the gentleman you referred to, to my show? Because because uh, he Bergen. was being, sorry, Ben Bergen, yes, yes, Ben Bergen, because he, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, he was learning strategies that were highly that were very leveraged, right? Yeah, you know, private money. Uh, I even I even met uh, one of his fellow students and I had a conversation with him. Uh, he at the same classes, he was instructed to use his personal line of credit to finance his renovations for his Burr project. Mm -hmm. I should probably check in how that guy's doing. He's not my client, but again, he's he's heavily in debt. <laughs> he's nowhere near 60, yeah. 65 percent loan to value if you include his uh, personal line of credit that funds the, uh, the renovations. <laughs> One of the reasons I wanted Ben to connect with you is because he's he's so honest. He's just a really honest guy and he he takes accountability and he is doing anything he can to protect his investors and his you know the people who have trusted him. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. I don't want to say more because he's a coaching client of mine and I really respect the um the 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 ethics the integrity that he has mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but i would say that uh he is behaving in a, an extremely exemplary way in a very challenging time mm -hmm. yeah i appreciate I, I was uh because he's good on the tools and he rolled up his sleeves to get this to get shit yes. done right but like thankfully yeah. thankfully think he did something right like for example he bought close to home Versus these investors who are buying like four hours away from their homes, like because yeah. Ben was able to bought close to home, he was able to roll up his sleeves and personally work on the property, right, to get things yeah. done. Uh, you know, because just for example, if those properties are four hours away from him, I think he mentioned at the time. I think he told me he had like four, three vacancies, three properties, three properties that were vacant. Yeah, right? and they were, if they were four hours away, either to be divorced or bankrupt or both. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. And, and I think there are, you know, you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, someone who is advised to go and, you know, it's really common in some of the, the big organizations to, hey, go, you know, call your credit card company, ask them to increase the limit on your line of credit, and then use that money to, to buy um, education. And there are sort of some of these... <laughs> I've been to those things. I've been to those pl those those courses. Please continue. Sorry. <laughs> yes, I went through it too. Um, I didn't make the call, but we, you know, we did sign up. I mean, you know, I, I give full credit to uh, to Rich Dad for uh, you know being sort of the beginning of my real estate education. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the challenges for a lot of people right now is we keep looking at other people and trying trying to make our lives fit theirs instead of going. I'm in a unique position right now. I have this skill set. I have this network. I have this information and knowledge. What can I do? What do I need to do to grow my net worth, increase my cash flow, but in a way that enables me to sleep at night? And just because somebody did something at some point in time and it looked easy doesn't mean that it is right now. I am well aware that when I started investing, you could get mortgages on multi-unit buildings with 5% down. So I do not think, nor do I coach people to plan to grow a portfolio at the rate that I grew mine because the financing is completely different. Mm -hmm. And you can't count on financing. Like if there's one thing I've learned over the last 10 years, it's that financing turns on a dime whether it's the interest rates going up, whether it's the underwriting criteria changing, whether it's the programs that the lenders are offering. Things change on a dime. You, it's a really, it's really challenging to buy a building right now and anticipate in three years, I'm going to refinance and pay all my investors back out. Because what's your plan B if the lenders have changed and the interest rates have changed and all these things have changed and you can't do that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You make a good what point. What is that? Because we're Go we're ahead. talking about like we're talking about multifamily apartment buildings, for example. And uh, I read the news regularly. One of the arguments about uh, like talking about renovations, for example, like it, landlords are heavily financially incentivized to to renovate, even if it means paying out five, ten, fifteen thousand to the tenant, because when they're able to raise the, when the landlords able to raise the rent, they're able to the multiplier effect based on cap rates and what CMHC will lend them is just so enormous that they're financially mm -hmm. incentivized. So I'm actually surprised CMHC hasn't been dragged into, the, into this conversation more for making it so financially lucrative for to landlords for renovating. So I actually would think that may stop at some point. <laughs> but I think there's sometimes there's what CMHC says and like their shiny glossy brochures. And then there's what the reality is. So what CMHC says on their shiny glossy brochures is, you know, we'll finance your building up to 85%. But on the back end, what people aren't seeing is CMHC, the appraiser comes in and they undervalue your building by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. So the actual loan to value isn't 85, it's like 72. All right. Yeah, I've been so hearing that going on for years, though. <laughs> yeah, but that's not what they advertise, right? right and right, if you're right. a newer investor, or if this is your first foray into multi-units, you might not necessarily know that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the other thing people assume is that it's always best to pull as much money out of a deal as you possibly can. And there are times where it doesn't make sense to do that. There are times when it actually makes more sense to have a slightly higher loan to value mm -hmm. because it protects you against times like we have right now where the cost of money has skyrocketed in the last 18 months. Right, right, right. Yeah, like the bird investors who who literally took all their money out of the deal. Like they've all, many, I know many of them have forced to sell. <laughs> yeah. Because, because and and yeah. it kind of when you're in that situation where you're negative cash flowing, the analogy I always use is how do you like to rip your band-aids off? Do you want to take them off slowly? So, you know, we're going to lose a little bit of money each month. We're going to have to put a little bit of money each month in to cover all the bills. Or do you like to rip your band-aids off real fast and we're just going to dump the property and take the loss? So what would you recommend your clients do if they were in that situation, Erwin? It's, again, my clients are a lot like you. They're much lower loan to value because they've had property for so long. So apologies to the investor. Elizabeth doesn't listen to my show, so I have to tell her. 
Sorry, <laughs> actually, I missed anything. Over the last six months, I actually I actually pulled data for my clients were selling. So what yeah. what did they take profits on? So over the last six months, my clients have sold property. The average hold was about five point two years. So you mm-hmm. can guess they did pretty well. I think the average pro, uh, the average appreciation alone was over three hundred thousand dollars, right? So assuming they didn't do any refis, but I bet you a lot of them did refis. But still, I can't calc- I can't keep track of all their mortgages situation. But again, uh, on average, my clients were walking away with somewhere over three hundred thousand dollars in profit. Give the payback yeah. on that. So, uh, so my my advice to my clients has always been has been for a while is that. Uh, sell the property that you cannot add any more value to. So often mm-hmm. it would be like, for a good example, would be like a freehold townhouse. You can't suite it. Yep. You can't add yep. a garden suite. Nothing really can do to it. Maybe you can rent yep. to own it. But there's already a tenant there and they're not leaving, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I, I think we have to avoid the tendency to become property hoarders. Um, I have one client who's built a really nice portfolio. She's got, you know, 10 single family homes. She's got a fairly low loan to value, but wow, 10 um, singles. <laughs> yeah, but she also, you know, she's got this great big kind heart and she hasn't been increasing rents. Uh-huh. So now that the interest rates have gone up, she's, she's underwater. So, you know, she made the really difficult decision and kudos to her because I know how much she cares about her, her tenants. Mm-hmm. Um, and she made the decision to sell. So she'll use the the cash from that property to be able to float the rest of the properties. Mm -hmm. But we can't be afraid to sell because there might be a potential in the future to make money is the way I look at it. Um, You know, the the appreciation, it's not guaranteed. I don't know when the market's going to come back. I, Mm -hmm. I don't know when things will start to turn around. I mean, the reality is. I think the only reason the market's doing as well as it is right now is because of all the the demand for housing, the immigration. Mm-hmm. And if we didn't have that, I can't imagine where the market would be, to be and honest. Easy, easy access to mortgages, too. Yeah. Well, that was in the past, less, the less past, so now. Yeah. Less so now, yeah. Agree. <laughs> yes. Agree. Oh, so I remember uh, it was a conversation you and I were having, uh, I forget, about six months ago. And then I asked you permission to share it uh, as a as a piece of advice, but I obviously gave you credit for it. Um, do you do you remember um, now that you mentioned the story for for example your your client your client with ten properties? How uh, one of the first things investors should do is speak to your tenant, give them the option to raise the rent a little bit, mm-hmm. or go and sell it. Because I'm I'm having that situation as well. Because I'm considering divesting a few, mm-hmm. and I'm going to have those conversations with my tenants. <laughs> so yeah. now that you're on the show, can you share what you've been telling your clients on how to talk to your tenants about maybe rent, raising the rent a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it's not a conversation that is ideal to have. Um, obviously, you know, the the tenants, you know, they would prefer that everything stays status quo. Um, the reality is, yeah. especially if you're in a situation where you haven't raised rents uh, at all, or you know just a, the bare minimum amount, a lot of investors right now are finding themselves in a lot of trouble. And if you have a good relationship with your tenants and can approach them and say, "Listen, like this is a situation I'm in right now. You know, I'm losing money every month. Uh, I'd like to figure out a way to be able to keep this. Is there an agreement that we can come to? You know, would you be willing to pay a couple of hundred dollars more? Now, in Ontario, there are challenges with that. So you can have them sign whatever agreement, and if they go back to the landlord tenant board within the next twelve months, they can claw back that that increase, even though they agreed to it and they signed a piece of paper saying that they agreed to it. So there is that kind of (laughs) caveat there. Exactly. Um, And this would be something that I would definitely recommend, you know, talking to a paralegal about um, because they should be very well versed in in Mm -hmm. these matters. Mm -hmm. But the the thing that I try and do is is I go to the tenant and I like, listen, I'm struggling here. I'd like to be able to keep this property. I'd like you to be able to keep your home. I I recognize that it's going to cost you money to move and not just financially, but it's going to cost you emotionally and it's going to be challenging. And I heard a stat the other day that for every one rental unit in the GTA that's available, there are nine families looking. So that makes it incredibly challenging to find new accommodations. So 
I can't think of a time where I haven't been able to come to an agreement with with a tenant in terms of and I'm not talking about like, hey, I'm losing a thousand dollars a month. You know, you need to pay me a thousand dollars more. I'm talking about both parties giving a little bit compromising um, and saying, how can we kind of work together so that we can keep this roof over your head? I don't want to be in a situation where I have to sell. And that helped her with my client who had the 10 units that kind of helped her too to be able to say like which property do i want to sell if everything was equal you know who are my tenants who value and respect me as a landlord and want to work with me versus my tenants who are like nope i don't want anything to do with you this is your problem and i don't care the reality is if we as as housing providers in ontario weren't here you know the small the small landlords who provide almost 50% of the housing stock, if we weren't here, if we were forced out of business, where are all the tenants going to go? Could you imagine if 50% of the renters in the province were suddenly homeless? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're not the ones who are responsible for what's happened with the interest rates. And, you know, people keep saying, well, when you when you buy when investors buy rental properties, then, you know, you're taking homes away from families. Well, we're also providing homes. I love that face. That face was hilarious. Because my majority of my properties are duplexes. So, mm -hmm. you know, and I made them a duplex. So I doubled the capacity of number of families I could live in them. Yeah. So I didn't take it from anybody. <laughs> No, and, and there's plenty of people when you go to duplex who are like not in my backyard. So you go like, we can't, how, what do we want this to look like? What do we want housing to look like in Canada in 10 years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, and also my tenants do not consider me a villain at all. <laughs> they all like them. They all like their homes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's, it's, it's misguided. It's, hate. it's tough to be a landlord right now. In, in all of Canada, but in Ontario in particular, I think, as someone who's got clients across the country, has invested in most of the provinces in the country, um, Ontario is a tough place to be right now. It's tough. There's, 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 you know, I've heard also, I, like, Fort Mac was burnt down before. I think they were affected by the fires recently as well. So there's worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yes, yes, yeah, it is. I was just reviewing my insurance policies yesterday and looking at the rebuild value of them and thinking about, you know, if if something happened, I would love the opportunity to to rebuild because I know like I just have such a vision for for the potential of things and and what's possible. Um so I can understand the absolute heartbreak that goes with losing your with losing your home and losing your property. Mm -hmm. I think we have to, you know, in, in times like this, we have to kind of focus on what are the good outcomes of this? What are the mm -hmm. positive things that can come from this? Because no matter how dire a situation is, there's going to be some small measure of, of positivity that comes from it. Okay, so here's a cold hearted economist out of me. <laughs> like That's why we balance disasters. each other. <laughs> these natural disasters cause inflation, right? Like the fires in Kamloops, oh, the fires in Yellowknife, the fire, uh, the fires in in Manitoba and Quebec. It, it's all inflationary, so we all need to be able to protect ourselves from inflation. But also, inflating is insurance costs because the insurance yeah. companies will recoup their recoup their losses and then just raise all of our rates. My my rent to my properties, I believe my rental my insurance went up twenty percent. So I'm getting those recorded. <laughs> yes. So I'm in the hunt for an, for a new insurance broker. But uh, yeah, yesterday you and I were talking about insurance as well. What are your thoughts on the future of insurance on on real estate? Well, I think as long as we continue to have these natural disasters, I think the price of insurance is going to go up. And I'm wondering at what point you know, the cost of insurance will become prohibitive. I mean, we need to have insurance in order to have financing, whether it's private financing or, or you know, from, from the banks. But at some point, um, there's not gonna be enough cash flow in the properties to be able to sustain major interest rates. So I'll, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out because there's areas that have been hit this year with natural disaster occurrences that were not kind of known for that. Uh, previously yeah. and so now like it, they should become cape coral what's it called 
Yeah. In Florida? Like, yeah, because yeah. our friends were down there because it normally doesn't get hit by a hurricane, but then luck as, uh, luck, you know, Murphy's Law. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even, you know, being in the GTA this summer, I don't remember, like, you know, it's common when I was up north in Kirkland Lake, it would be common to have smoky air because we had forest fires up there. But it was, it's unusual to have had the amount of smoke in, in southern Ontario that we've had this year. So, I, I think we could be, there could be a time in the future where the cost of insurance just becomes prohibitive. And then we need to have a plan for how we're going to finance properties if we can't, you know, if, if insurance isn't a thing, uh, isn't a thing anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I've been saying for, for a while, like, thank goodness we're in Ontario. We don't really have natural disasters, which yeah. are more common now in Canada. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's part of the due diligence that we need to be doing. So now when we're looking at a market, it's not just, you know, who is the major employer and what is the average income and, you know, what is the, the price of a starting or an entry level home? Now it's also, you know, what kind of natural disasters, you know, are we looking at floodplain maps? Are we looking at, you know, the, the hundred year history for forest fires in the area? Like we need to be looking at all these things as well, because with real estate, we really need to be looking at the long game right now. A lot of these strategies that have become so popular, you know, when the markets were, were going up significantly, like burrs and, you know, pre-construction and those kinds of things, they aren't working right now. Those strategies are not making money right now. So we need to be looking with a cool head at the opportunities that are going to come from long, slow growth, as opposed to, you know, the, the quick turnarounds with injections of cash. Right. Yeah. The, the, the pursuit of fast money has been, uh, has been road to ruin for many. Yeah. We know many people are going through it. Um, even, even like philosophically, I was, I was thinking about like HGTV, for example, because I was interviewed for a show and I told the producer, I'm going to tell it like it is. My investing is very slow and boring. Mm -hmm. I know it's not what I see on your channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, flips take 22 minutes. Didn't you know right. that? But my point is, is that that's, that was the first touch point of real estate for many people was that it should be fast and fast money in and out mm -hmm. and big returns. So like you and I have, you know, have private conversations about like, oh, can you believe like this person taught this and then the students ruined and blah, blah, blah. But man, it starts even before that. Like, I almost wonder how much, if they're even responsible, like what responsibility do they have to tell investors how it really is? Like yeah. on television, right? But, but then versus, versus that's why this show exists because the show exists mm -hmm. was started for that reason. This is the truth. We're talking truths. A lot of people are hurting out there. A lot of stuff people saw on HGTV did not work out in this time. Like the last 12 years, it worked great. <laughs> if you bought in the GTA, you know, Greater Vancouver, right? A lot of those strategies work great. No different than buying pre-construction condo. Probably worked, worked pretty well for the last 20 years until it didn't. <laughs> yeah. Right. No different than flipping homes. Worked great probably for most roughly the last 20 years or so. And now it does not work. And hopefully people didn't lose, lose, lose everything in this, in this short period of time. Yeah. yeah. So, but my point was, is going to like, what is working? Because I know you're having these well, conversations I, with your clients. Yeah. I, I have some different philosophies um, about investing. So I know that there's a lot of focus on a strategy, like choose a strategy and then do that strategy and, and make that strategy like your life. So now you're a flipper or you're, you know, someone who does burrs. I kind of, the, where I see the opportunity right now is to look for properties that are significantly under market value. And when you find that property, then take a look at where the opportunities are. So it's the same as you said, you tell your clients it's time to sell when they can't wring any more money out of a property. Take a look at a property and figure out where the opportunities are. Is it on a large lot? Is it in a municipality that supports garden suites? Um, you know, do you have the opportunity to, you know, put a tenant in, cover your expenses right now and, you know, tear it down in five years and build? What is the potential? What is the highest and best use of this particular property? And focus less on the actual strategy and the execution, because the best deals that I've ever done are the ones that I bought farthest under market value. And I've been able to, I like to do something I call layering. 
where if I can put multiple strategies on a property, I'm doing really well. So let's say, for example, you're a new real estate investor and someone comes to you and says, hey, uh, my aunt just passed away. Well, we're looking for someone just to take the house. It's full of her stuff. You know, it's super dated. We don't know what to do with it, but we don't want to have a realtor going through and we don't want to have to clean it up. And you go, OK, and you come in and you look at it and you go, well, if I knew how to do renovations, I would probably do a flip on this, but I don't. So I'm just going to find someone to buy it and then they're going to do the flip. So you wholesale it, you make, you know, 10, 15, 20 thousand dollars. Well, when you know a little bit more as a real estate investor, you come in and you go, I'm not going to sell it to somebody else. I'm going to actually do the work myself. So you do the flip yourself and then you list it for sale. And then when you know a little bit more than that, you come in and you do the work and you fix it up. But instead of selling right away and locking in you know, that current value, you do a rent to own on it. You generate cash flow and you sell it in three years. Or if the tenant buyer doesn't buy, then you do another rent to own on it. So the more kind of strategies you can layer in, the better the return from that one property. I think we need to focus less on how many properties do you own, how many units do you have, and way more on are your properties optimized? Are there you know, is there potential to make more money from your existing properties? Because quite honestly, it cost me less to do marketing on my commercial building and get my rents, you know, my occupancy back up, that cost me less than for me to look around for another property generating cash flow that I can buy to offset the negativity, the, the negative cash flow position in my commercial building. I was better off optimizing than I ever would be buying. So that would be my number one tip right now for investors is take a really good look at what you own already whether it's you know if you only have your home then you start with your home and you say are there opportunities here are there things that i can do can i build a coach house can i you know put in a, a basement apartment maybe i'm seeing a lot of basements lately where there's actually two apartments going in the basement which is kind of cool and mm -hmm. in a housing shortage yeah that's not bad at all mm -hmm. Or uh, I have a client that uh, they don't they didn't sweep their basement. Instead, they rented out by the room to international students. Uh, sure. Um, I forget the term. It's not billet, but basically, you, you are their custodian. You are their uh, their guardian. So you, mm. you cook for them as well. So they're, they're living with you. Ah, right? room and board. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, kind of like a midterm bed and breakfast. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> uh, yeah. And, and this is, you know, this is what some of us, the, the challenging times that some of us may be focused on, you know, or that may be dealing with right now. And we need to focus on what do we need to do? This is not the time that you want to be selling if you don't have to. And, you know, in, in five years, the investors who are able to hold on, we're going to mm -hmm. be in a good position. Mm -hmm. So it's really about what do I need to do for the next, you know, 12, 24, 36 months mm -hmm. to be able to get through this rough patch, because mm -hmm. in 15 years, we're mm -hmm. going to look like geniuses. Mm -hmm. I think that part of that as well is um, I saw a video about how many rich people are selling their multi-million dollar cottages. Um, part of it is probably I'm sure some people need to sell. I think part of it is some some people are trying to get liquid in order to take advantage yeah. of that opportunities. Because before we start recording, we we're, were talking about folks who are in mega trouble, mm -hmm. right? We're like, um, like my condo friend uh, who who sells condos and owns condos. He 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 was telling me how the the assignment on the assignment market, uh, the buyers their 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 opening bid is basically twenty percent less than they than the seller paid for it. Right. Yeah. So if that's your thing, like that's that's great opportunity. <laughs> right. Uh, but also in like apartment buildings, like you know, I was talking to another friend of mine who had to sign a nine page NDA. <laughs> so he couldn't tell me who was in trouble. <laughs> but yeah, he's offering on someone else's buildings as well, because uh, they're under threat of power, of power of sale uh, by their lenders. So, yeah, you know, I, I don't mind selling some of my stuff at market slightly under market in order to go after a, a, a knock your socks off opportunity like you're talking about so yeah. that's completely undervalued yeah and you know if you have your duplexes that you've maximized then it's almost like people as as real estate investors it's like we we believe our worth is based on how many units we have or or you know how many properties it, find the best investors are the ones who are much more fluid, the ones who recognize an opportunity and are able to jump on that and take advantage. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, 
you know, having too much ego. And I think that's one of the things that Ben really highlighted in his podcast with you too, is that he feels like it was ego that led him Mm -hmm. astray. And as real estate investors, we have to be focused on numbers, but we can make numbers say anything. It's like stats, right? You can manipulate statistics to basically tell you anything. And I've watched investors and I've talked to investors and I've seen them run numbers and like, oh, but this and that and that, that." and they've completely turned a deal around and made it look amazing. And, you know, you talk to them about why they do that. And they said, because I feel like I'm missing something because it looks like everybody else is doing deals and everybody else is making money. And I feel like there's something wrong with me that I can't find a deal or that I can't, that I haven't closed on anything in six months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make you a bad investor. I mean, there's a difference between not taking action because you're afraid of making a mistake mm-hmm. versus not taking an action because the numbers aren't working. Yeah. Yeah. Like I was, I was talking to, I was telling a friend the other day, like Warren Buffett has not made a major move yet. Right. Cause I, I remember, I always remember when he bought, when he got preferred shares of, uh, of Goldman Sachs back in like 2007, he made a massive move when people thought the banking industry was going to die. Right. Like, um, uh, so fast forward to today again, like I said, he hasn't made a major move. Uh, my point is that we're not at maximum pain yet. <laughs> no, I don't think we are. And, and where I was I going didn't. with this is also because you you are a New Brunswick investor. So was was oh, you're out. I have one building. I have one building left out of how many? Oh, I don't know. We had like 50 units down there. I don't know. 12 buildings, eight buildings, right. something like that. Right. And you weren't a fan of New Brunswick. <laughs> While we have this whole other cohort who are rushing over there. (laughs) So we have buildings down there that we bought. We started buying in New Brunswick in 2010. Much and, better time, time, uh, time than to buy than 2021, <laughs> I yep. imagine. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Um, and we, we held them for a long time. So we started selling, I want to say like a year and a half or two years ago, we started selling. Mm-hmm. And, um, the appreciation there so we we bought because we thought we'd have fantastic cash flow and the reality was when we looked at the books at the end of the year the cash flow was nothing like what we projected by the time we factored in the actual vacancy rate um, dealing with bad tenants and non-payments dealing with repeated bed bug treatments and all the other pest control stuff that we needed um, dealing with apartments that were left full of garbage that continually had to be cleared out in order to be made ready for the next tenants to move in At the end of the year, we didn't generate even close to the cash flow we were looking at. And then because we were buying in a in a smaller or more like a tertiary market, we also didn't see a lot of long term appreciation. Mm -hmm. So most people would think, you know, when you sell a building after after 12 years, you would expect to have a, a really nice check. And that just didn't happen on a lot of them. I mean, we didn't. There, there was there was no situations where we had to put money back in, but you would think like if you had owned a single family house in Ontario for 12 years, even if you sold it now versus, you know, the height of the market in 2022, yeah, you should still million. have yeah. several hundred thousand dollars, like a yeah. really significant return. And we just didn't see that in New Brunswick and the amount of time and energy we put in mm-hmm. for what we got out of it. I, I wouldn't do it again. Let's put it that way. Can you name and city? I'm not encouraging my clients either. I know because there's a lot of hype behind New Brunswick, apparently. <laughs> I think it's it's cooling off from what I've seen. Um, and that doesn't mean that there aren't deals and opportunities out there. But I think one of the biggest mistakes we make as, an, as investors is once you take action and buy a building, you need to give it like six months to stabilize. And then you need to look at the actual numbers and then you need to apply those actual numbers to your projections and forecasts before you buy your next one. Because we bought a bunch of buildings. We actually bought a portfolio of six buildings to start. And it was like, boom, boom, boom. And they all closed. And I think if we had stopped at that point and looked at the numbers, we might have slowed down and not continued to buy so aggressively. Mm -hmm. Especially in these times as well. I hope those folks are doing okay in New Brunswick. Yeah. Now, something else I wanted to ask you about is rent to own. <laughs> yeah. In today's market, like you, you were talking about like layering strategies, 
are to rent to own is one strategy. How are you you prescribing rent to own these days? Rent to owns, um, they're a strategy I love because you are dealing with a different type of tenant. It's not the normal tenant that you'd see in like, you know, a, a bachelor apartment in a multi-unit building. Um, typically you have people who have owned homes in the past or have always dreamed of home ownership. They've grown up in, you know, in a home um, and this is part of their kind of vision. Um, so I like to use them right now for investors who are struggling. So I have a couple of clients, they've got duplexes. One of the units has come up vacant. And I said, before you list it to get it tenanted, let's give it, you know, two weeks, three weeks, let's post it as a rent to own and see if we can get a rent to own tenant in there because they, they're going to pay fair market rent. And then they're going to, under the option contract, they're going to pay a premium each month. They're going to give you a down payment or it's called initial option consideration when they move in. So you get a bit of a bump at the beginning. You get higher cash flow every month, but they also take a lot away. So you don't have to pay for property management anymore. They now become responsible, legally responsible for the snow removal and the lawn care. Um, you don't have the repairs and maintenance the same way. And especially in a duplex, it's really powerful because you can teach them how to be become um, a landlord and you know they're a homeowner in training so you're teaching them how to deal with all these things they're going to deal with when they own the home so between that increase in the monthly income and the decrease in the expenses it can make a really significant difference for a landlord who's negatively cash flowing the uncertain part of rent to owns right now is most rent to owns are predicated on the idea that if you buy a house for 500,000 right now, it's going to increase in value by 5% year over year for the next three years. And your tenant buyer is going to buy it for that amount at the end. The challenge is my crystal ball broke a couple of years ago, and I can't tell you whether the market is going to be back at, you know, the 5% year over year in three years, or it might be flat. So you need to know what's your plan B. If you get to the end of the rent to own and the house is not worth what it's supposed to be or what you um, what the contract says it's going to be, what are you going to do? Are you then going to turn around and, and say, yeah, you know what, uh, you're, you're refusing to buy the house for more than it's appraised for, so you need to leave. Are you going to offer them an extension? Are you, you know, you need to have these other ideas in mind for what you are willing to do in the event that things don't go exactly according to plan. But you need that with every with every property, right? You need multiple exit strategies. If you've got all your eggs in one basket, if you're thinking, you know, all I'm going to do to make money is I'm going to sell and you can't sell, what happens next? Now, uh, you, you mentioned that the, the now the tenant owner is responsible for the property in terms of maintenance and whatnot. How mm -hmm. do you do that? Is that a, is that a side agreement? Yeah, so it's all covered under the option contract. So in a rent to own, my tenant buyers sign two types of agreements. One is the standard Ontario lease, which gives them all the rights and privileges afforded to them under the Residential Tenancy Act in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And then they sign an option contract. And the option contract is basically everything else. So it's governing their purchase of the property and when it's going to happen and how much it's going to be for. It also governs all their responsibilities as the person who's holding this option contract. So under there is where I put like, you know, if your kid flushes a face cloth down the toilet, you're calling the plumber. You know, if um, if the you know, if, if the lawn needs to be cut, if there's snow that needs to be shoveled, you are assuming responsibility for all of these things. But it's not under the lease, which means that it's you're not in that territory that um, you're requiring the tenant to do something that you can't legally get them to do without a separate contract and compensation. Super cool. And then who, uh, you mentioned duplex. In the case of a duplex, who, mm -hmm. who uh, so the, the still traditional tenant, who do they pay rent to? They would pay rent to the person, the tenant buyer who's doing the rent to own. So basically what I That's as beautiful. the- That's so beautiful. So the original landlord is basically like hands off now. <laughs> Yeah. So the way I envision my rent to owns, and I love doing rent to owns with duplexes because my vision is to take the tenant buyer and to provide enough education and support and resources that I turn them from a renter into a homeowner into an investor. So that in the future, you know, five years after they buy their, their, um, after they buy the property, they do a refinance, they pull capital out, and now they go buy their dream home. 
And in the meantime, they have this nice little duplex that's, you know, increasing in value and, you know, providing an income for them. But they'll need to be supported and educated on, you know, how do you list a, a unit for rent and how do you screen your tenants and how do you manage if there's a problem? But the tenant buyer, typically I rent own them the entire house. And so they are responsible for making sure that payment gets done. But, you know, if they if a tenant moves out after a year and they put a new tenant in there who's paying two hundred dollars more rent, that's two hundred dollars more in their pocket, mm -hmm. not in mine. I'm not mm -hmm. going to increase the. The price that they're paying, that's the, to their benefit. So they could actually do short term rentals with it if they wanted to. They don't have to put in a long term tenant if they want to clean in between, if they want to create this little kind of side hustle and they want to clean the apartment and list it on Airbnb. I'm OK with that. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. As long as it's allowed in the municipality, of course, but yeah. And they have proper insurance, whatnot. Yeah. And then how much more rent are they able to get than say market rent? It depends. Sorry. Um, if you were the landlord, it would depend. if you were yeah. the owner, if you're the landlord, uh, how much more rent? Yeah. How much more rent do you get for a rent owned duplex? <laughs> well, so the CMHC has came in a few years ago and made a bunch of changes to how rent to owns were structured. So one of the changes they made is they said you can't charge more than fair market rent under the lease agreement. So I would go and I would look on something like Padmapper, for example, and I would see, you know, what are main floor apartments renting for? What are basement apartments renting for? I'd add those two numbers up and I'd say this is the amount you're paying rent for on the entire house. Mm -hmm. And then um, whether it's tenanted or not, you're still responsible for paying that. But any increases or benefits, they, they're they all yours. But it it would be just the same as if they were uh, if they bought a duplex on their own. Right. You know, there's no guarantees that you're going to have all your units occupied. You need to plan financially for how you're going to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's still be still be market rent then, but at least the landlord's able to wash their hands of any sort of maintenance. Yeah. And management. Yeah. 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 It's market rent. Plus there's the extra amount, the option consideration that the tenant buyer is paying in every month towards the down payment of their house when they buy in the future. Okay. And how much, how much would the, how much would the option consideration be? A couple hundred bucks, a percentage? Every, every company does it differently, but I like to keep my numbers really clean and simple because I find when you make things complicated, people stop trusting you. They stop when they don't understand, they don't trust, which is fair. I get that. So if, for example, someone needs $50,000 as a down payment to buy the house in three years, and they're coming in with 20, then for me, the math is $30,000 that needs to be saved up over 36 months. So that's what you're going to be paying. If you come in with 30, then you only need to get to, you only need 20,000 more. And you divide that by 36 months and that's what you're paying. It's, it's pretty clean math. and simple. Pretty easy to explain to someone then. Yeah, I've been doing this for a while. And a lot. <laughs> I tried a lot. I've tried a lot of different ways. I mean, I used to do it that, you know, the the lease said this and then the option contract said, you know, you pay us $1,000 a month, but you only get a credit for 800 of it. And when you start messing around like that, people, like I said, when they don't understand, they don't trust mm -hmm. you, which is fair. So for rent to own as an exit strategy, are you offering it to your existing tenants or this is when you're when you have a vacancy? Uh, I have in the past when we were considering selling, uh, we had a portfolio of properties, 19 units before we started our rich dad education. So these are properties that I bought before I knew how to buy. So these were like six condos, six pre-construction condos that we'd closed on that were all in the same building. And then we had a bunch of single family homes and duplexes, and these were all in, in the new market area. Um, so I use rent to own as an exit strategy with those tenants. And I said to them, do you want to, you know, do you want to do a rent to own? And if they said no, then when they moved out, I would list for sale. Fast. But I had three or four tenants at the time who took me up on that and actually did the rent to owns. This is pretty cool stuff. Because rent to own has been very quiet for a while. It's like very people, it, it's hard to do them as a way of entering uh, an investment. Would you agree? Is that fair? Well, rent to owns don't make sense when you're buying in a seller's market. They they just they they don't make sense. The numbers don't work. It's it's incredibly difficult to, you know, 
buy, you know, when when homeowners are are one of, you know, a dozen or two dozen parties that are putting offers in on a property, you're not benefiting your investor or your tenant buyer by offering over list price. Usually with my rent to own properties, I'm looking for something that is either already a duplex or is that is duplexable. And I'm looking for a property where I'm going to be able to force appreciation in the future if I need to. So I'm looking for something that's probably dated. You know, we got the like pink, you know, the, there's all the, there's the what pink, uh, green, purple and blue bathrooms, you know, where all the fixtures were that color. Like, oh, I don't, you'd be better able to tell me what was that the sixties, the seventies. I think when they bought the house in the fifties. <laughs> Yeah. So that's like, I see that and I'm like, ding, ding, ding. Like, this is the type of place I want because I'm always looking to protect my investor. So, and as well as my tenant buyer. So if my tenant buyer does some renovations and fixes the house up over time, their pre their future purchase price is already predetermined. So that's their equity that they benefit from. If they choose not to buy and they move out, now I have the opportunity to do like a, a, a mini flip, for example. So I come in and I fix up some kitchens and do some bathrooms and paint and flooring. And then I turn around and list the property for sale or I re-rent to own it or whatever it is, but I'm benefiting from the opportunity to be able to make those renovations and force the value of the house. So I'm always trying to buffer risk as much as I can. Right. And I think this was lost on a lot of speculators on the in the rise up, right up uh, in the rising market, especially pre, anyone who bought pre-construction in the suburbs or out of the ex, ex herbs or mm. condos. Like they didn't look at it like a business. They didn't do any sort of analysis on having multiple exits. You know, even when people were buying them, the Airbnb was not an option. They knew it wasn't an option. So like there really wasn't. You really you were stuck with renting it. And eating that negative cash flow, assigning mm -hmm. it, or closing and selling on it. Yeah, but I. But that's think not enough this... options. <laughs> no. There's so many more and options I... with with more traditional real estate. I think this is one of my biggest takeaways from coming through 2008 as an investor, though, mm -hmm. seeing people like just drowning, seeing people going under, seeing people walking away, and. You know, I learned a lot of lessons um, from listening to other people and from asking their stories and asking, you know, what, how did you get in this situation and what would you do differently? And looking back, how could you have prevented this from happening? And one of the biggest, one of my biggest takeaways was um, make sure that you have multiple ways to make money in every single piece of property you buy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and make sure that if selling doesn't, like I, I would never buy a rent to own property where if the tenant buyer moved out, I couldn't cover my expenses with only the fair market rent. That that was one of my like ground rules when I really got into rent to own. So there are people who are doing rent to owns in these major markets and, you know, they're having to make up this negative cash flow on the option consideration side because fair market rent, you know, if you buy a million dollar house in Toronto, you are not breaking even you're not even close to breaking even on, on what you can get by renting it out. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest indicators to me for markets where rent to owns works is do, does the fair market rent cover my monthly expenses so that if the tenant buyer moves out, can I do a straight rental on it and still break even, or mm -hmm. am I going to be negative? Can you name any cities that works that works in Ontario? <laughs> So this has been the biggest challenge since interest rates went up, right? Because rents have nowhere near gone up as much as as the the monthly payments have. So back when you know the interest rates were three percent, four percent, we were still able to do rent to owns in more in most secondary markets. Um, the offsetting price decreases I've seen have kept us in some of the markets, but by and large, it's definitely. Um, I haven't checked on numbers in like Barry, for example. That was always one of my favorite places to do rent to owns. I like Barry, I like Aurelia, um, you know, kind of the Kingston, Belleville markets like that. I like rent to owns. Um, Toronto was just too expensive. Most of the GTA was just too expensive, although I've done them in Oshawa and Bowmanville and um, uh, Burlington and Brantford and 
It's all, it's like a horseshoe around the horseshoe. <laughs> so something else we were, we wanted to talk about was, I don't know how to call it, but let's call it private lending, getting your money back. <laughs> that's, that's why I titled this segment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I imagine this came up in your strategy calls to people because you were doing portfolio reviews with people. So people were sharing, like, I have these private mortgages out. Yeah. And then you're, you're uncovering all sorts of issues with repayment. It sounds like. Yeah. I find by and large, the biggest challenge for most people who do private lending is they don't want, they're not comfortable going after their money. I have one of my clients right now who lent money out nine years ago, has not received a single payment. Um, now that was a partnership that wasn't just a private lend, um, but has not received, has had multiple promises that the money was coming back. It's not even an enormous sum of money. Like we're not even talking six figures here. We're talking five figures. Right. But, but when I, six figures out though, to the same person. Well, oh yes. <laughs> but when I asked them why they're not doing anything, they said, well, because I don't want to, I don't want to upset whatever is going on in the hopes that whatever they have going on is going to give me my money back. And I think if people have money, they're probably going to pay you back. So when you're not getting paid, that should be an indication that there's trouble. And that should be an indication that you need to have some of those tough conversations mm -hmm. and you need mm -hmm. to take action. Yeah. You know, if, you if taking me, action, sorry. Like, cause when you, when you told me about that, um, cause I know the person, my immediate response was they can, they should be able to sell one of their buildings to be able to pay back everyone yeah. because your client likely has a case for OSC to get them shut down mm. more specifically see OSC may cease, make them do a cease and desist. Mm -hmm. And that would probably ruin them. So they yeah. should be incredibly motivated to settle. <laughs> yeah. Am I, am I, would that be this is, <laughs> this is the phenomenon with other people's money though. This is the, the fallacy with, with listening to, you know, anytime you buy property, use OPM. And the reality <laughs> is if you're borrowing a hundred thousand dollars from someone, a good investor is going to have a hundred thousand dollars in equity in or or access to capital somewhere so that if the deal doesn't go the way you thought it did you can make good on or make whole on that promise or that commitment you made to that investor but op the concept of opm has gotten twisted over the years and it's become use opm when you don't have anything of your own so <laughs> what's happened get into is real estate with your own money don't have money. That's exactly. okay. Just use other people's money. Oh yeah. And then it says, you know, oh, you have this infinite return. And blah, blah. Well, what happens when the market goes down? What happens when things don't go according to plan? Cause I don't know about you, Erwin, but I've had a couple of deals that didn't really go according to plan. And I had to reach into my back pocket and say, how am I going to make this investor whole? So if I sell a property, if I access a line of credit, if I, you know, I don't know, it's, it's, like, downsize my my quality of living for a couple of years even if you can't pay them back all at once and you establish a payment plan and you make payments on it but this whole get into real estate with nothing when when you own nothing and have no ability to pay it back that's i don't know i i have an issue with that i have a fundamental issue with teaching that to people because i'd like to say that if you lose investors money once that you won't do business again. But I think we both know people who've lost investors money and they just changed markets or they just changed strategies or they mm -hmm. just, you know, they moved to another province, another area, another country, whatever. And they did the same thing all over again. And I think part of the due diligence that we do as investors has to be not just on the deal, but what kind of capacity do you have to pay me back if this deal goes sideways? Because I would never leave my investors holding the bag. And I've been an investor almost 20 years. And mm -hmm. I haven't made money in every deal. Mm -hmm. Now so, we differ on we differ on some of the th on, on who we give money to. Because basically I have I've shared on the show, I don't give money to anybody. <laughs> so I mean I don't have any of your money, Erwin. I, if you were I, handing out money, I would hope I would know. <laughs> um 
I, I've shared on this show, I, I, I only invest with like, like very enormous uh, investors. Um, uh, but you've shared on the show before you, you've, you've, you've lent to clients, for example, like, what is, what was it about them that, that made you lend to them? Um, two things. One was their integrity. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I knew that they were the type of person who would, um, they, they would get a job. They would go back to work before they would, before they would leave their investor hanging mm -hmm. out, twisting in the wind. Uh, and the second thing was I had seen the rest of their portfolio and I knew that they had the resources to be able to cover it so that even if this particular deal didn't work out the way that we had planned, they had the capacity to be able to put a loan on or to be able to sell or to be able to access capital that was elsewhere right. uh, in their portfolio. Right, right. So I think what happens is when we remove the idea of OPM without having your own resources, you have to grow slower. You know, this is, you're not doing 12 deals a year. You're not leaving your job tomorrow. It, it's this real estate, it needs to be slow and steady. And we, we've just gotten so warped over the last couple of years, like, you know, the the skyrocketing prices and anybody can make money and, you know, you buy at a, you buy at a loss, but you still sell for a profit and, you know, just grab other people's money and put it all in and, you know, none of your own infinite returns. Like, it's coming back to haunt us. It's so sad. It is sad. And there's a lot of people who are unfortunately going to be collateral damage. And I think going back to what I talked about earlier, this is the opportunity that we have from these tough lessons to learn how to do things better. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is the opportunity to put our phones down and to say, who am I as a person? And what does that look like in the world of investing? Mm -hmm. I have integrity, you know, I, I value other people and other people's time. You know, if someone gives me $100,000, they have had to earn $200,000 to have that $100,000 to give me, right? So if that's the case, I need to be a good steward of that money. I need to be respectful and understanding that if I don't have $100,000 in my back pocket, I have to somehow make good on that. So. I think this is a, a little bit of a, a wake up call and an opportunity for us as investors. You know, what are our systems and processes we have in place? How, who do we decide? How do we decide who we want to partner with and who we want to give money to? Mm -hmm. This is where we need to say, who am I as an investor? What do I stand for? And what does that look like? And maybe mm -hmm. you buy one, you know, you buy one property a year and not five. That's okay. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely okay to not be going 90 million miles an hour and running deals and looking at numbers all the time. You are much farther ahead to buy one good property a year than to buy five crappy ones. Agree. And I'll even throw in that I, I think it's, I've been saying it more often is, I think it's better to go have these on a great property in yeah. a good city versus trying to trying to buy something affordable on your own. So literally an example I gave uh, this young married couple was uh, they couldn't afford a duplex. So they bought a new pre-construction condo. <laughs> so we can all guess how that went. <laughs> Their realtor told them the condo was a great deal. They're negative like $1,200 a month on it. And then, so yeah, they literally asked me, what should we have done? Like, you could have just gone have these on a great duplex. <laughs> like yeah. you may, might be negative on it, but you would be negative 1200 a month. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a tough time. I think there's going to be a, a lot of lessons. And this is what happened in 2008, too, right, where there's mm -hmm. this mass exodus of investors out of out of the market. Mm -hmm. And then 2010 happened and we had to put 20 percent down to buy. And there was a whole bunch more investors that left. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. there was this like lull in the market, you know, 2011, 2012. And then things started to pick up. And this is one of the challenge when you have a lot of people in the space sharing a lot of information, but they don't have the years of history yeah. that you highlight for your clients as being mm -hmm. so important. Mm -hmm. If you haven't come through a downturn, if you don't understand the economics, if you don't understand the fundamentals of the different investment strategies, then it's going to be it's going to be riskier for you. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is when you need to educate yourself mm -hmm. before you take action, not mm -hmm. after. Or talk, and talk to people who've been around. Because I remember when I, we were renting our properties back in 2008, we had more tenant applications than we, than we had property. So this, this these times actually remind me of 2008. It was really mm -hmm. difficult to get a mortgage back then, just like it is now. Yep. But there are tons of tenants looking. 
to rent. Uh, so it's just like that. And, and also, I remember uh, when we had our, um, back in 2008, like that version of Epic Alliance, like a colossal mm-hmm. bankruptcy, a portfolio of over 50 properties uh, all went on power of sale. And investors were picking up those properties. Uh, turnkey tenanted properties for like 20,000 less than market value. But at that time, 20,000 was like 15% off. Yeah. That was subs- yeah, 50% <laughs> off. That's, that's substantial. Back 20,000 was 15% back then. So that was substantial. And those same properties were worth now over 600,000. Mm-hmm. So again, I don't have a crystal ball, but uh, I know a lot of smart people who are, who are, who are deep pocket investors who are buying right now. So yeah. But this, what we're talking about, Christian, it's it's not sex, or Christian. I was just oh, thinking. I'll think that as a compliment. I'm going to email that guy right now. <laughs> <laughs> what I was going to say was, Erwin, what you and I are talking about right now isn't very sexy. Yeah. And our friend Christian has yeah. believed in this and espoused this for years as an investor mm-hmm. too, right? Mm-hmm. So we're we're not the only ones. We're just we're just not the ones having the sexy conversations on social media. That's yeah, we don't have TikTok accounts. <laughs> I have a TikTok. I do too, but I don't. I, I deleted it. It was. It, it was. It was just too much. <laughs> I. I. My vision with my TikTok. I only got it like a month ago. But my vision with my TikTok is a lot of my clients are like, I want to know who you are. I want to know what you're doing on a daily basis. I want to know what you're thinking about. And I'm like, mm-hmm. well, you know, I've just got this. Um, I. I have sort of a polished, I like to think anyways, that I'm somewhat polished on, you know, my YouTube channel and Instagram and all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And they're like, we really want to know more about you as a person. Like, what do you do every day? So Mm -hmm. that was my vision with, with TikTok was just a little bit sharing a little bit more about like who I am as a person, what I'm thinking about. I don't know. You're laughing at me. What's wrong with Facebook? (laughs) What's wrong? I'm not getting another platform to do more work. (laughs) I'll post my Facebook and Instagram, those things. (laughs) Yeah, you're so polished though, and you have you have people to help you. I'm like navigating how to record my own video and put captions in. Victoria Clooney, bless her heart, she's the sweetest girl, and she's like, okay, this is how you use TikTok, and she like recorded a video and showed me, and I got home to record my own video, and I could remember like fifty percent of what she told me I need to do. Mm-hmm. I can't remember how to edit and take out the pauses and all that stuff. So I figure I'm gonna get an, a lesson when I go to Ottawa again in a couple of weeks, and and I'll get a little bit better, but. I think the other part of TikTok for me is that showing up in the moment and not having to be perfect. And that's outside my comfort zone. Hmm. So for me, TikTok is actually personal development because it's just about like, this isn't going to be perfect. I'm going to say, um, I'm going to say, ah, I might Mm -hmm. pause Mm -hmm. and that's okay. Mm -hmm. It is okay not to be perfect. Done is better than perfect. The, the consistent thing about your clients of yours that, I, that I'm friends with, like a Melissa Dupuy or like a Ben Bergen, they're perfectionists. And they're so very they, driven. they're very uh, And they're not flashy at all. And they do not boast, which yeah. makes them to me and make them to me, that's a great salesperson. Right. But to the masses, they want that really confident person. And that's this. That's often the last person I'm giving money to. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think we attract a certain type of person into our uh-huh. world too, right? Like my clients, by and large. Like I hosted a, a a networking event just for my clients a couple of weeks ago in uh, in Richmond Hill, and there was about twenty of us there, and um, they all got along. Like, it was just so amazing to see, Mm -hmm. you know, all the similarities and the the personalities that they shared, the integrity, the values. And there were three of them that figured out they all lived within like a block of each other in Toronto. So the next thing you know, they formed their own little group and they're going to meet weekly or they're going to meet monthly and they're going to support each other. And um, I, I think I'm not a salesy person. And I don't. So I don't think I attract that. Like, I'm more interested in how can I help people? How, you know, mm-hmm. what can I learn from them? What can I share with them that's going to help them out of their tough situation? I mean, anybody who does a discovery call with me, you know, there, there's no speech, there, there's no, you know, yes, or yes. I just want to help people. And I consider myself really lucky to have been around long enough to have seen enough to hopefully be able to help people mm-hmm. when they're struggling. So speaking of trying to help people, you have a conference coming up. We need to discuss that. What's it called? When is it? It's called the Real Estate Resilience Summit. 
So we had our very first one last year, which you were our opening speaker for. You were amazing. Oh, thank you. And um, so our, our the idea behind it, myself and, and my co-host, Corey, we just wanted to be able to help people. And we wanted to be able to put high quality information in front of people that didn't have a huge cost associated with it. That there wasn't a huge barrier to entry for mm -hmm. this good quality information. So um it's an online summit which kept things really affordable uh tickets right now are 74 dollars until the middle of september uh so by the time i'm assuming we'll probably be a couple of weeks out till this airs about three weeks yeah so if if we if this goes out before september 15th then the tickets will still be 74 if it's after september they're going up to a, a whopping 99 that is extremely it's, inexpensive. It's an entire weekend event and it really, it takes clients through or it takes um, attendees through the same process that I go through with my clients in my one-on-ones where it's, you know, what are the opportunities you have right now to optimize? How do we protect what you have right now? How do we reposition it? So we look at strategies that generate cash flow. We have speakers talking about student rentals, talking about rent to owns, talking about short-term rentals. Um, and then we talk about what are the things that you need to know in order to grow once you've stabilized and optimized what you have. So we're going to have securities lawyers on who are going to talk about, you know, all the stuff we're seeing on social media with people going, hey, partner with me, give me money. You're talking about what that email I sent you this morning. The one that was mistakenly yeah. sent to me, it was for you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so what do we need to know before we start putting ourselves out there on social media? You know, how are partnerships structured? Um, you know, what can we say in public to people we don't know versus what needs to be, you know, after we get to know them for a while? And then we're actually going to have a social media expert on and he's going to talk about how do you start to build your presence online? What do you focus on? Because it gets really overwhelming and we, you know, we're looking at eight different platforms now. Like, how do you decide where to put your energy and focus? So the idea behind the weekend is really high quality information. Um, nobody is paid to, to be a speaker. Everybody is there because they're really passionate. They believe in what they're doing and they just wanna share information with people. Um, the thing I like about the summit platform is that it's just like attending a live summit. There's um, an expo hall and people can come and interact and chat with the different speakers after their presentation. And uh, we have all kinds of gifts and then we have uh, gamification as well. So people have contributed uh, prizes interestingly this year last year we had you know tickets for wealth hacker and they were so sought after and so in demand and this year it seems to be a lot of education people are really focused on how can i help the investor community rise from from the challenges they're facing so i'm hoping everybody comes out and uh spends a weekend with us i'm really excited where can people get more information I will give you links that you can share, but uh, people, if you find me on Facebook or Instagram, um, you can always Elizabeth Kelly Consulting and all the links are there for you as well. Fabulous, fabulous. And then uh, are you, what's the, your discovery calls, your strategy calls, who is that available to? Any investor, if you are having a challenge, if you, if there's something you'd like a second opinion on, you, you'd like someone to weigh in as an expert, to you'd like a you have a challenge you'd like to talk through whether it's a partnership going sideways whatever it is um discovery calls are free they're 30 minutes and then the strategy calls those are a little more intensive uh that's an hour that we spend over zoom together diving really deep into your problem you'll walk away with action items and things to do that are going to address the issues that you came in with uh, and they typically take a couple of hours for me to prepare for so be prepared you're going to have homework to do before the strategy call because mm -hmm. if, if they don't if they don't have their homework ready, you're not showing up, right? Well, that's it, right? Like they so um, people will need to prepare a, basically a snapshot of their portfolio so that I can help them identify opportunities that that they can realize uh, if they're coming in looking for that kind. Otherwise, if they're looking at deal analysis support, they would need to send everything over so I can look it over in advance. Fabulous, and I see lots of my friends are speaking. I even have a client on your speaker roster. <laughs> Well, we'll have to chat about that afterwards. I'd like to know who all who your friends are and who your client is. That's wonderful. Awesome. Anything else? Um, so I always, I always like to have my guests uh, have some free time to say whatever they want. I have you for eight more minutes. <laughs> anything I didn't ask or anything you want to cover? 
Um, I can't think of anything in particular, but I just want to encourage people not to be pessimistic that there are opportunities that are going to come from every situation and what we're facing and the challenges we have right now this is really a defining moment um, this is an opportunity for you to decide what you want to look like in a year two years three years as an investor and then figure out what's in the gap between where you are now to where you want to be and you know it's funny because i tell my clients all the time like it's important to have this power team these people around you who can help you people like you or when you are an expert in your market you're an expert in your strategies like you know your shit and absolutely can help people get through it and I, I didn't really think of that so much myself until, you know, recently I had some challenges and I needed some help and I needed to um, get some quotes for my insurance. And I reached out to my friends and I said, hey, does anybody have like an insurance person? I need commercial insurance on this very particular type of building. It's in a market that a lot of insurance companies won't look at. And oh, I gotta um, go. <laughs> well, that's what my friend said, too. Yeah. So literally. I spoke to they she made the introduction for me. Um, Jessica Boyron made the introduction for me. And I was on the phone with the guy and he answered my phone call and he made time for me. And he talked about how much he loved and respected working with with Jessica. And then like he, I, I didn't have to I didn't have to call around. I didn't have to vet a whole bunch of people. Those referrals and the people in your team are absolutely invaluable. So even if you're just starting in the world of real estate right now, don't underplay the value of going to events like your I win your you know your tours and your networking don't underplay even if you're not quite ready yet to take action, start building your network of people. Start bringing in, you know, the people that you can trust, the people who have the same values, ethics, and integrity as you. Don't let the headlines and what's going on in the news stop you in your tracks from what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'll add to that the experience portion. People who've been around, who, who went through 2007, 2008, yeah. that experience is very valuable for these times. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of patterns. I see a ton of patterns. And the investors who will come out from this the best are the ones who are going to see the opportunities and are taking the steps now to position themselves for action in the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. And you need lots of cash or lots of income <laughs> or both in order to take action, to be credit, to get credit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This this is the time to, to be liquid if you can. I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> Elizabeth, thanks so much for doing this. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. It's always nice to catch up with you. You are absolutely such a wealth of information. I love hearing your perspective, especially because you're so well read. I pretend. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for watching. If you want to learn how to invest in real estate from scratch, my team teaches beginners how to use the number one investment strategy that I personally use in a virtual free training class every month. Go to investortraining.ca slash YouTube to register for our next class. The link's also in the description as well. I publish at least two to three videos a week here, so subscribe if you wanna keep learning from seasoned investors like myself and my guests. And if you're just starting out, feel free to ask questions and comment below, and I do the best to answer each of those comments and questions myself. Again, if you're ready to learn the nitty gritty about real estate investing from a professional investor, register for our next virtual class. That's at investortraining.ca slash YouTube. Thanks again for watching. See you in the next video.